John Lennon comparing the Beatles to Jesus was far from the most outrageous thing the Fab Four ever said. From insulting entire countries to bands breaking up right before our eyes, these are rock star interviews that hit all the wrong notes. In 2013, Lisa Kennedy Montgomery, known professionally as Kennedy, was backstage at Lollapalooza, where she interviewed DJ Diplo and other members of the electronic dance group Major Lazer. The encounter became instantly legendary for becoming awkward and oddly combative. Kennedy insulted her interview subjects repeatedly, informing them that she could have them murdered and mocking Diplo for accepting $400,000 to perform in Dubai. And when she asked who the most annoying person they've ever worked with was, Diplo snapped. Probably you. An article published on Complex speculated that Kennedy engineered this viral moment to boost the sales of her just-released book, The Kennedy Chronicles, The Golden Age of MTV Through Rose-Colored Glasses. She did, after all, refer to EDM as EMD, which sounds like the sort of on-purpose mistake you make just to get a reaction out of someone. Whatever the truth behind it, this interview has taken its place as one of the most uncomfortable ever. In 1995, Madonna was well-established as one of the biggest pop stars in the world, while Courtney Love was a major force in rock music after the release of her band Hole's second album, Live Through This. When MTV's Kurt Loder sat down with Madonna after the MTV Music Video Awards that year, it went off the rails in spectacular fashion. Her poise was tested early on, when a clearly drunk love began throwing things at her, prompting Madonna to say, Come on, Courtney Love is in, the, in dire need of attention right now. Loder invited Love to join them, and she then proceeded to ramble on drunkenly as Madonna's soul basically left her body. Love accused Madonna of being rude to her on a prior occasion, apparently believing this justified her interruption. Madonna, as you might imagine, did not agree. Love then got on her knees to tell Madonna that she and her late husband Kurt Cobain loved her film, Truth or Dare. This freaked Madonna out completely, as she then signaled to her team that she was done, leaving Loder to salvage this fiasco on his own. In December 1976, Queen was scheduled to appear on Bill Grundy's Today Show on British TV, but then lead singer Freddie Mercury came down with a toothache and canceled. So in the scramble to fill the spot, the band's record company offered up a new act, The Sex Pistols. To say this interview did not go well is an understatement. For two and a half minutes, the band and their entourage managed to launch themselves into controversial fame while also basically ruining Grundy's career. First off, he introduced the band with an off-the-cuff quip he would come to regret. They are as drunk as I am. Grundy was simultaneously disinterested in the band and determined to mock them, eventually prompting lead singer Johnny Rotten to utter an expletive live on air. The host also flirted with some of the women in the entourage and made the mistake of asking the band to say something outrageous, which prompted even more cursing. The Pistols got the publicity they wanted, but things didn't work out for Grundy, as he was suspended for two weeks and then his show was cancelled. Ian Molly Meldrum is a bit of a legend in Australia, and his pioneering music show Countdown is a big part of his legacy. In 1979, Iggy Pop was booked to be interviewed by Meldrum and then perform his song I'm Bored, but then it all went terribly wrong. The singer was an irritating mess right from the get-go, as he began by interrupting the host's introduction. One album. Hiya, dog face. <laughs> Iggy, how are you, mate? The rocker then proceeded to jump around and make strange noises. He was incoherent and made exactly zero effort to respond to any questions. Then when he performed, it was just as bad, as he generally exhibited contempt for the entire experience. It's easy to assume that Iggy was under the influence of a few substances, but he's claimed that intense jet lag, combined with the feeling of being tricked by his record label, led to the disaster. He was exhausted from the trip, and he was upset to discover upon his arrival that he wouldn't be performing live anywhere as he'd expected. As he recalled in 2016, while Meldrum was trying to interview him, he said to himself, do not let yourself take this guy seriously. Have you ever heard of a band called the Boxmasters? Chances are slim unless you're a big fan of their founder, actor Billy Bob Thornton. There's nothing wrong with using your fame and fortune to pursue your other artistic dreams, but Thornton takes things a bit further by insisting that journalists pretend that his acting career has nothing to do with his band. Canadian radio host Gian Gameshi found that out the hard way in 2009 when he dared to bring up Thornton's acting career. Instead of being classy about it, 
Thornton proceeded to respond with profanity, non sequiturs, and generally rude behavior. Worst of all, he decided to insult everyone in Canada, calling them mashed potatoes with no gravy. We got some gravy up here as well. Yeah, yeah you do actually, yeah. on a lot of things. <laughs> Despite this evidence to the contrary, Thornton is generally regarded as a good interview subject, so rumors flew that he wasn't entirely sober, though his management team denied that. One thing is certain though, Thornton felt no remorse, even after having to cancel some concerts in the wake of the appearance. He appeared on Jimmy Kimmel Live shortly afterward and shrugged off the criticism. He also admitted that he'd pulled similar stunts when interviewers ignored his instructions and dismissed the viral nature of the video by insisting it gave humpback geeks all over the world something to do for a couple days. In 1979, legendary rock band KISS were on top of the world. They were an unusually hardworking group, grinding through a grueling tour schedule for years until their 1975 live album Alive broke through in a big way. From 75 to 79, they kept up that punishing pace, with five studio albums, more touring, and a solo album for all four members. But there were big problems simmering underneath the surface. KISS had oversaturated the market, and they were seeing declining ticket and album sales. Plus, the band members pretty much all hated each other. Everything came to a head when the band appeared in full makeup on the talk show Tomorrow, hosted by Tom Snyder. In his book, Makeup to Breakup, drummer Pete Chris admits that he and guitarist Ace Fraley got roaring drunk backstage. This prompted Fraley to take over the whole interview, cackling and cracking joke after joke, which clearly annoyed Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley to no end. Stanley even later said, It may seem funny that someone's drunk, but the fact is, the root of it was, I believe, a contempt and lack of respect for the audience and the fans. As Chris put it in his book, the band had settled into two opposing camps, and the friction between them during this interview was a sign of things to come. By 1982, both Chris and Fraley were out of the band. Rock star interviews can be fawning, superficial affairs designed solely to promote a new album or tour. So anytime an interviewer gets a little aggressive, it can be exciting. But in 1997, British talk show host Clive Anderson went a little too far while chatting with the Gibb brothers of the legendary Bee Gees. The group was promoting a new album and were reportedly told that Anderson was a big fan. But the host's strategy for the interview was more insulting than provocative. He opened up by suggesting that they were bad songwriters and then proceeded to mock their famous high-pitched falsettos. Because I didn't realize you were real brothers. I I oh, think yeah, you're yeah. sisters, actually, yes. but... <laughs> but uh, <laughs> well, I thought we were coming yeah. to that in a few yeah. minutes. <laughs> Anderson also called the band Tossers, which is British slang for a stupid person, and claimed not to remember some of their hit songs. Barry Gibb later recalled the experience in a 2016 interview with The Sun by explaining, it was just a barrage of inferred insults. The group tried to play along, but eventually, Barry had enough and simply walked off. His brothers followed him a moment later, leaving Anderson a bit flustered. The interview was reportedly a last-minute addition to the show, and Anderson came to regret his jokes. In 2020, he admitted to The Spectator that he made the mistake of not realizing the Bee Gees wouldn't find his humor entertaining. In 1996, Weezer were following up on their hugely successful debut album with their sophomore effort, Pinkerton, so lead singer Rivers Cuomo dutifully hit the promotional circuit. While touring Australia, he stopped by a show called Recovery, hosted by Dylan Lewis. It started off awkward and only got worse. To begin with, Lewis got Cuomo's name wrong, calling him River Weezer. He couldn't remember his actual last name, so he just improvised, thinking he could get away with it, but he didn't. Cuomo was visibly irritated and more or less refused to engage throughout the rest of the interview. The rocker claimed that he was jet-lagged, but as Lewis insisted to Junkie in 2019, he wasn't jet-lagged, he was wasted. I'm sorry, but he was. But it was Lewis who was hit with most of the blowback over the interview, with Weezer's Australian fans blaming him for the band's lack of touring down under. Lewis doesn't exactly like being constantly reminded of the interview, as he told Junkie that he wished it could be scrubbed from the internet. The Beatles were famous like no group ever before them. They handled it remarkably well for a while, that is until 1966, when they gave a series of interviews that appeared in the London Evening Standard, in which John Lennon quipped, We're more popular than Jesus now. I don't know which will go first, rock and roll or Christianity. 
The quote was basically ignored at first, but a few months later, it sparked some controversy when a magazine called Datebook used the Jesus quote on its cover. Afterward, there were protests in the American South, public destruction of Beatles records and merchandise, and even death threats. The band eventually organized a press conference where a visibly shaken Lennon tried to explain the nuance of his point, which he said was more about the state of organized religion than the greatness of the Beatles. It's not I never meant what people think I meant by I'm still sorry I opened my mouth. What's remarkable about this disastrous series of interviews is that Lennon's line about Jesus is just one of their awful quotes. Paul McCartney called the United States a lousy country and used a racial slur. Ringo Starr referred to his much younger wife more or less as property. And Lennon even said, I couldn't stand ugly people even when I was five. Lots of the ugly ones are foreign, aren't they? Overall, the band was probably pretty lucky that the Jesus quote is the only one anyone remembers. James Brown was an electrifying performer, but his life off stage was far from perfect. He reportedly regularly beat his wife, and he was raised by a violent father himself. He also spent time in prison, fathered multiple illegitimate children he took no interest in, and struggled with addiction. This all came to a head for Brown in 1988, when he was arrested and charged with attacking his wife with a lead pipe and firing a gun at her. At this point in his life, it's believed that he was addicted to PCP. This is a drug that's notorious for making its user's behavior unpredictable, which is exactly how Brown's interview with CNN from April of that year could be accurately described. Many people reportedly believed that Brown was high during the appearance, and it's not hard to see why, as he bursted into song multiple times and at one point went into detail about his sexual prowess. If you or anyone you know is struggling with addiction issues, help is available. Visit the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration website or contact SAMHSA's National Helpline at 1-800-662-HELP-4357.